in this uh, three-week uh, program on, on, uh, on turbulent combustion. It's a, a very challenging subject. I mean, I, it seems to me that we're, we are here these three weeks like the blind man examining uh, the elephant. And uh, blind men, one blind man grabs the tail and says the elephant is like a rope. And the other grabs the ear and, and says, no, the elephant is flat and flabby. And the other one grabs a tusk and says, no, the elephant is hard and, and, and straight. And the other grabs the foot and says, no, the elephant is like a vertical uh, barrel. And the other grabs the belly and says, no, the elephant is like a a gigantic horizontal barrel. Well, uh, that is roughly uh, the viewpoints of the different people, entirely analogous to the viewpoints of the different people here at, at this uh, three-week meeting, because we all come to turbulent combustion from different points of view and see it differently, uh, just like the blind men with the elephant. And so it means we have a lot more to learn about turbulent combustion, number one, but number two, it means we really have some exciting uh, knockdown discussions <laughs> among ourselves about uh, what turbulent combustion really, really is like. <laughs> and so this has been, a, so far, a very uh, uh, revealing uh, 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 get-together uh, for me and I think for all the rest of us attending this this. Uh, this uh, uh, a long workshop, if you can call it that, <laughs> um, and it and so it's it's a pleasure for me then, uh, in this context, to to uh, introduce to you uh, Alan uh, Kirsten, uh, uh, Ph.D. I think Princeton is that right in physics, and of course he's at uh, Sandia Livermore now. Uh, I remember. Uh, uh, an example of these, uh, like these uh, blind men with the elephant, uh, my first encounter with Alan, um, uh, Paul Clavan and I had done a really uh, uh, excellent, correct an analysis of turbulent flame propagation for small turbulence intensity. Uh, and, now, and we proved beyond a shadow of a doubt but the thing that, in my mind, was the most certain thing, the only certain thing about turbulent combustion that would never be disproved, namely that the turbulent burning velocity at sufficiently small intensities, if you neglect uh, density changes, so that density is constant, <laughs> the turbulent burning velocity surely increases quadratically with the turbulence intensity. That was absolutely certain. Then along came Alan, <laughs> and he asked, well, what happens a little bit la later time <laughs> if it really settles down and does what it's going to do forever? And um, he says, no, it doesn't go that way. It goes to the, it, it, it increases as the four-thirds power, not, not, not quadratically. <laughs> um, now, uh, I was sure Alan had to be wrong, and I studied his work and studied it and studied it. And finally I decided that the one thing in turbulent combustion that I thought never would be disproved was disproved. <laughs> so Alan was right, <laughs> and we were wrong, and Alan and I have been great friends ever since. <laughs> so Alan is known to most of you as Mr. One-Dimensional Turbulence. I tried and tried to convince him, I mean, there's, this is the least impressive title that you can imagine, <laughs> one-dimensional turbulence. I said, Alan, at least call it triplet map turbulence or something like that. He insists on calling it one-dimensional turbulence. He has become Mr. One-Dimensional Turbulence. So I'm happy to introduce you today, Mr. One-Dimensional Turbulence, Alan Kirsten. Thank you. I feel like I should spend most of my time responding to some of your uh, remarks. First of all, I chose that name because it's so 
provocative of skepticism that I think it brings people to the subject with exactly the right attitude. And as far as the four-third scale, I'm going to uh, discuss that on Wednesday. So, good, that was an introduction to my Wednesday talk as well as to this one. Well, uh, yesterday, uh, Victor uh, gave us a presentation where he showed us how uh, in a very much studied problem of turbulence, uh, he along with uh, his colleagues who do experiments and numerical simulations could look at a, re uh, a regime in a slightly different way, probe a little farther into the dissipation range, and uh, come up with results that seem to overturn our entire perspective on uh, turbulence intermittency and the role of the inertial range. And I think that's a very good illustration of what I will try to illustrate further today, which is as much as turbulence has been studied, every time we're able to probe a little farther, a little deeper, or a little, with a little sharper eye into some new facet of turbulence, something surprising or uh, astounding uh, or unexpected seems to come up. And I'll try to show you how, uh, with 1D modeling, uh, it's been possible to uncover a ver or at least uh, clarify uh, some of these surprising elements. And the surprising elements uh, that I'll address are listed here. It's just a whole variety of things, just to illustrate the scope of uh, the topics in, in which things are not quite as settled as uh, people might have supposed they are. And uh, the, uh, the value of the 1D modeling in this context isn't uh, that, it, 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 that uh, it's, design, it's designed in some special way to capture some feature that, that of turbulence that people didn't know about in terms of its, the, the fundamental character, the processes, the couplings, but, but the fact that it's able to represent these things in a more concise, more economical way, so we're able to explore, uh, affordably explore computationally regimes that people haven't looked at yet. And having a capability as simple as that, as you'll see, has some very interesting consequences. So what I introduce is, uh, <coughs> Foreman rep, uh, referred to the triplet map. The concept, it's not really an introduction, it's just a reminder and, so, and a uh, recasting <coughs> of the concept of map-based advection. Now, in Lagrangian schemes, it's common to use a, uh, or a, a Lagrangian or a mixed Lagrangian or Eulerian scheme. Uh, you'll often take a map-based step within the time advancement cycle. You'll map the mesh. Uh, in the co-flowing frame, and then maybe map it back to a, a fixed mesh. But in any case, we're very familiar with map-based infection as a numerical technique. However, I've, I've developed a physical modeling construct based on this uh, uh, concept of map-based infection. And uh, an important feature is that you can then uh, do a useful uh, flow simulation, turbulent flow simulation, in lower dimensions than you can using the uh, original governing equations now for your Stokes. It also has some other uses that I won't discuss today, but uh, next week we might uh, get into some of those discussions. So I've ad adopted an idealization called the triplet map to represent what I call the quantum of turbulence, just in a conceptual way, the quantum of turbulence being one eddy turnover. And uh, so this is showing you uh, a, a multidimensional field with isolines of some property C, and so you can imagine an eddy turning it over. And uh, so suppose you originally had a linear profile of some property after the eddy. Uh, you might have some property with the profile instead looking like this. So instead of trying to capture the entire process of the eddy rotating so that you go from this state of the property to this state, what the map is intended to capture is simply the final outcome of the eddy rotation, not capture the entire motion leading to that outcome. And the triplet map is intended to do that, and it's uh, convenient first to look at a discrete representation. Since it is a map and it's intended to be a conservative map, it's simply a permutation of cells when implemented in this discrete representation that in the continuum limit consists of simply taking a region intended to be the uh, support of a particular eddy that we're uh, trying to uh, represent, uh, take the profile in that uh, region, uh, compress it by a factor of three, insert three compressed copies, flip over the middle one so that 
uh, you don't introduce any discontinuities into the profile. And so we have a simple uh, conservative continuous uh, map or transformation of all property fields, and that represents our idealized uh, 1D eddy. And importantly then, it's just an ejection. It doesn't mix contents of any fluid cells. So when we apply uh, the diffusion operation uh, in, in the context of this modeling, it truly represents the fully resolved uh, a, fl a diffusive flux generated by the true uh, gradient of the property and the true molecular diffusivity. We're not going to introduce some eddy diffusivity representing uh, advection as if it were a diffusion, and that's a very key uh, feature of the model. And just being a conservative, uh, in, a, in essence, permutation of cells, it's by construction conserving all properties contained within those cells. And importantly, uh, we think of the terminal cascade as a sequence of uh, scale reductions and gradient amplifications, but each step being uh, order unity uh, scale reduction. This is the concept of the locality of the cascade. We don't take through one uh, turbulent motion or one mode of the, uh, uh, of the flow a, a large structure and, and squeeze it immediately down to the finest uh, micro scale of the flow. And therefore, we want the map to reduce fluid separations uh, by the smallest uh, factor possible within the context of uh, this structure. And it's pretty obvious intuitively, but not yet proven, that uh, the triple map uniquely, either a triple map or a simultaneous composition of triple maps, is the unique uh, mapping operation uh, that, al that allows you to uh, uh, to, to enforce that scales are reduced by at most a factor of three. It doesn't seem that you can be more local than that in a 1D map representation. Now, within this approach, uh, there are uh, two different uh, types of formulation that have introduced. It started with the linear eddy model. Importantly, this is a turbulent mixing model, meaning you have to parameterize the turbulence in some way. In other words, uh, tell the model the frequency of these mapping events, their sizes, and where they're placed. And uh, having done that, you can then apply the sequence of maps, which are, uh, uh, which are basically punctuating an, a background process of the ongoing diffusive advancement. And you can apply that to scalar fields in order to predict turbulent mixing based on the parameterized turbulent properties. So you're just applying this to scalars. Then later introduced this one-dimensional turbulence, and now instead of uh, uh, simply dictating when and where these eddies happen, the model itself uh, provides information based on its current state to assign a probability distribution to these eddies, and that probability distribution evolves because the, s the flow state itself evolves, because now this model is carrying velocity profiles. So now it becomes pr predictive of turbulence evolution, although there are a couple of uh, three parameters in it, as I'll show you, it, it's much more of a turbulence prediction model than just a scalar mixing model, and its input then uh, is the specifics of a flow configuration, and you, uh, you start it, and it'll give you a flow advancement in prediction. So, uh, well, okay, so I told you the basic structure of the model here, and since it's in 1D, you also have to treat the diffusive part in an approximation, so I'm saying that the uh, model coordinate is denoted y. And so a formulation as simple as uh, one of these shown here, just basically the heat equation punctuated by these uh, eddy occurrences, can give you interesting behaviors, as I'll show you, although there are also embellishments uh, to these formulations to treat other processes, as I'll indicate uh, in specific cases. But we can certainly talk about uh, this level of simplicity for uh, uh, for starting out. So the way I'm going to introduce the model is step by step by starting with simplest possible formulation, show you something interesting we can learn from it, and then move on to another aspect of the formulation. So something really simple is to say all eddies are at one fixed size, this capital L, and we're going to just sprinkle them uniformly along the line, and it doesn't really matter exactly what map frequency we choose, provided that the eddy transport generated, I should say the you know, total scalar transport generated 
by this mapping sequence has to be far greater than the, uh, than the, terminal, than the uh, molecular diffusivity we're assigning to the diffusive process. So there's not really many parameters here because we don't really care what this ratio is provided that it's large. We don't really care much what this L is and we apply, we, we apply uh, this process to initial sinusoidal uh, scalar uh, and I've shown it with uh, period L but it doesn't have to be exactly L, it could be order L. In other words, this is more or less a parameter free initial value problem and uh, we, we, we run it on any domain as long as it's sufficiently large to look effectively infinite. And we ask, what is the time evolution of scalar variance and scalar power spectra? I have to credit Pat McMurtry for saying, this is such a simple configuration, I don't expect much, but let's just try it because uh, why don't we just uh, see what's out there, even though we don't expect anything exciting. So when his grad student came out, up with spectra uh, looking like this, we, uh, we tortured him into uh, searching for, for two weeks for the bug in his code until we realized he was seeing physics. Uh, so, what he's, so these are uh, the sequence of power spectra at increasing time uh, that he saw. And then once we finally understood <coughs> that there was really physics in this, we were able to then start to collapse the spectra in different scalings. There's some time dependent k hat that we used here uh, to uh, scale the wave number. And we also have a, see a time dependent scaling of the, uh, of the power spectrum. So we were able to come up with an interpretation of this. Rather than going through the analytics, I will illustrate uh, the physics behind this by showing you the result of an experiment that uh, Pat, along with Joe Flewicki at Utah, did to investigate uh, what was going on here. Now, the stirring is at wave number one. Okay, well, let's look at the unscaled plot. But you can see some very interesting things are happening. Now, this high wave number stuff is, is not the interesting part. These, uh, this sinusoid is because we're only using triplet maps of one side, it would go, size. It would go away if we had a, a range of sizes. But this low wave number stuff is what's interesting. So the, so the physical setup is we're stirring at a small uh, wave, uh, large wave number, small scale, getting something interesting at a large scale. Now, where does that happen? And uh, Pat's insight was, let's look in a pipe. Because in a pipe, the diameter limits the size of the turbulent eddy to be of the order of the pipe diameter. But if you look actually along the pipe, there can be fluctuations of much larger scale. So we said maybe we'll see something like this if we simply measure in a pipe flow. And so that's what they did. They set up a really long pipe, hundreds of diameters uh, downstream they look. And the challenge is just to build a big pipe, but the, whatever uh, mixture you're using initially, you know, you have to have concentration variation. And you have to be able to see very da far down the pipe. You have to be able to measure very small concentration fluctuations because we're looking far in the decay range. And that's the technological challenge, but they were able to do this uh, with various uh, sophisticated techniques. And then they set up in the experiments various initial conditions, either uh, with a, a, a laser initiation of a, of a specialized dye. They were able to set up plugs of, uh, a, 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 an opaque fluid within a transparent, or they used a splitter plate or a T-junction. And the details vary from uh, setup to setup, but the basic process uh, uh, was the same in all the cases. Uh, so here's one of the uh, initial signals, say, from uh, the experiment A. So what happens is you, you end up getting some kind of broadband white noise looking signal, but the, uh, the mixing, uh, basically the terminal scale reduction and then the uh, molecular diffusion is smoothing out the small scale, getting rid of the small scale hash, and what it leaves behind is large scales that take a much longer time to decay. And the reason they take a long time is because remember the eddy size is constrained by the pipe diameter. So you're just trying to, once you get to this stage, you just have these relatively small eddies that can nibble away at these uh, large scale fluctuations along the pipe diameter. So that's the basic intuitive uh, interpretation. Of course, you have to go into a somewhat more detailed analysis of uh, wave number couplings in order to explain the uh, uh, you know, the spectra that I just showed you, but it's fairly straightforward to go, uh, to go about that. Now, we did some simulations where instead of one eddy size, we introduced something that's more uh, intended to represent the uh, si size distribution of uh, eddies in, in a pipe, that is to say, the, uh, the power spectrum of the, uh, 
of the velocity fluctuations we might expect. And we got qualitatively similar behavior, and then it, it collapsed down like this. And uh, also, we were able to show as part of the analysis that for the 180 size, you get a 2 to minus 3 half decay of the variance with the one map size, with the pipe size uh, distribution. You know, it's getting towards that, but so it at least approximates it. Now, you can just have these in mind as I go to the next slide and show you the experimental, uh, first the unscaled and then the scaled spectra. So you can see that even at the level of the uh, details of the um, uh, wave number couplings that govern this process, uh, it pretty much conforms to uh, what we're seeing in the model. Now, this, this addresses the variance decay. Now, this issue was uh, analogous to the story Foreman told, quote unquote, settled in 1966 by Brodke, who uh, confirmed uh, a previous analysis that said, oh, a pipe is just a batch reactor that's moving, where the batch reactor is just moving downstream at the bulk uh, flow velocity. And so you just have an exponential decay of uh, the scalar fluctuations, the scalar variance. And you had a nice exponential uh, decay going out in, in, to about the, in the units of pipe diameters to about 30 pipe diameters. So what we've done is look farther, both in the model and in the experiment. We go to more than 30 pipe diameters. In the near field, yes, we see this uh, exponential decay. But then we have this transition when we do a different kind of plot. Instead of going semi-log, we go log-log so we can distinguish a power law decay. There we have it in the experiment. So it was a matter of looking a little farther to find this regime. And uh, so uh, this classical problem uh, was one in which the supposedly asymptotic regime was nothing more than the initial transient. So now I'll take one combustion case, and I'll save other combustion discussion for uh, you know, next week for Monday. So we had some discussion I think it was on Wednesday about uh, whether this distributed combustion uh, regime in turbulent pre premixed flame propagation, which is problematic because of radicals and radical recombination. But <coughs> astrophysical flames work differently. They basically just have a temperature dependence, and so they never really quench. So you can go to arbitrarily, arbitrarily large turbulence intensities, and you'll, you can still have a flame. So it's interesting to inquire as to what these flames look like. This has not been much studied. We really can't do this in the laboratory with our typical uh, chemical systems. So now we take another step in the model development. As I told you, we're going to look at this uh, step by step in terms of adding features to the model. So now we add a distribution of eddy sizes that's specifically set up to match the behavior of the inertial range of turbulence. I won't go into these details. In some cases, I'll have some detail on the slides for those who are more uh, interested in, in terms of a specialized uh, uh, knowledge of this. But uh, I'll say simply that uh, uh, that this was set up so that uh, the, the range of maps represents what you'd expect in terms of the uh, range of uh, sizes of motions in, in uh, a strongly turbulent flow. So the first thing we did, and this was another discussion of uh, Wednesday about uh, the, the Bell and Astman DES DNS, which was of the well-stirred reactor regime, where the flame brush size is a lot thicker than the size of the largest eddy. So an instantaneous flame brush looks fairly smooth. This is from the linear eddy simulation, but the DNS instantaneous <coughs> profiles look, uh, look quite similar. Uh, the DNS has a couple, uh, the LEM has a couple of uh, parameters describing the eddy size distribution and the overall uh, stirring rate, or I should say the overall uh, eddy occurrence rate. Uh, and those parameters have to be tuned. So we did that by benchmarking to the uh, Bell and Aspen uh, D DNS of uh, this particular regime of a, uh, an, ast an astrophysical like or highly idealized one-step reaction uh, intended to be in an astrophysical type regime. And so we're able to come up with uh, reasonable parameters to, uh, to get in the right ballpark of uh, their DNS. But what they could not investigate is what happens when the eddy size is much larger uh, than the, uh, 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 
than the overall uh, the size of the reaction rather than being uh, the size of the reaction zone rather than being much smaller. I call this the stirred flame regime. And there are other things, you know, before you've discussed the other terminology for it. I just call it that so it doesn't have connotations to people, kind of a neutral term. In any case, what we find in this regime is some very interesting looking structures, in order, in, including local regions of relatively uniform mixing, which is interesting from the viewpoint of the supernova problem because what we're looking for are indications of the possible transition from a deflagration to a detonation. And uh, in order to do that, you're looking for volumetric burning, which would uh, be most likely to occur in a region that's relatively homogeneous. So uh, the, just to give the context here, I think uh, some people uh, may be aware, uh, just because uh, it's kind of a, uh, been a widely heralded feature of supernovae, that they're viewed as standard standard can candles that can measure the expansion of the universe and uh, people are not really sure, you made this point also Foreman, as to whether they really are standard can candles because we really don't understand uh, how they explode. And uh, there are observational constraints that suggest there's a, a delayed transition from deflagration to detonation, but at least those who have studied this and simulated uh, this uh, uh, I found that this, this uh, uh, required, observationally required scenario just couldn't be reconciled to what they were concluding about the conditions under uh, which uh, this might happen. And uh, the linearity simulations, uh, actually this, the simulations themselves were done by Stan Woosley, uh, who's worked on this problem for a long time. And so what he did was he started with some uh, uh, instantaneous states, as in this uh, uh, as in this frame here, that were generated by the linearity model, and then he plugged them in as an initial condition to a hydro solver uh, to observe what happens, and he found some interesting behaviors that uh, we hadn't previously anticipated. Uh, in, in effect, at least in this particular scenario, uh, it's, it behaves almost like a pyrotechnic, where you have uh, 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 hot regions that are brought into a relatively uniform background, they act as igniters. The uniform background then acts as sort of a primer uh, component. And then once that gets, it gets going pretty well and it build, it builds up some overpressure, in effect that overpressure then slams into a region that behaves as the main charge and then sharpens up to a detonation. So, you know, one could have just speculated, because we know about pyrotechnics, we've designed them, that this, something like this might happen uh, in a supernova, but that would be uh, uh, not very soundly grounded if we didn't at least have some indication from a simulation that was relatively neutral in terms of specifying uh, which kind of initial conditions might be set up uh, to get the, the detonation going, uh, that this kind of thing can happen once in a while. However, you have to remember, this isn't Navier-Stokes uh, DNS that's generating this initial condition. It's a model. So we have to question in particular whether those occurrences of uniform mixing that are suggested by the model are physical or if they're just an artifact. Interestingly, when people look at scalar mixing, for instance, in this recent DNS, but the, the features seen in here have been known for a long time, which is that the scalar undergoes a, 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 uh, a similar process of being locally uniformized by turbulence and, and then have uh, kind of cliffs or jumps in between these relatively uh, homogeneous uh, regions. There are some uh, uh, intu intuitive type models that have been developed to try to explain this. But the interesting uh, implication here is that LEM, you can see uh, it's a model of really minimal simplicity is generating similar behaviors, and most of the explanations involve uh, uh, assumptions that are very, more, very much more specific to uh, 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 intuition about the dynamics of Navier-Stokes and so on. But this is suggesting that there's a much more generic, essentially more mathematical than fluid mechanical explanation for these behaviors. Haven't uh, determined yet what that might be, but this is a very important uh, topic for further investigation, 
and uh, this topic's importance is further highlighted by the fact that it's not only a theoretical or academic question, but it may uh, relate to the uh, occurrence of uh, the observed scenario of supernova detonation. So now I'm going to take us uh, back from, uh, we went from engineering to astrophysics, we'll come back to uh, uh, something that's more in an engineering context. So now we're going to be using one-dimensional turbulence. As I mentioned, uh, the, the, there's now a feedback mechanism because the eddy selection procedure is based on the local state. In particular, uh, as, I'll show, as I'll elaborate, uh, it's based on some measure of the local shear. And so here we have some velocity profiles. So this is supposed to be a transverse profile of streamwise velocity. And in fact, we're going to talk about the planar mixing layers. So this could be some hypothetical, uh, well, it's, it's too smooth to be turbulent, but it's the overall shape of the, the velocity profile in a, in a mixing layer. So if we had some triplet map occur here, you could see we've increased gradients. So there's more shear in, this re in these regions, so small eddies within here are more likely to happen than, uh, than, would have, than their likelihood would have been before this map. And so we can have a feedback process such that we'll get smaller eddies here and they'll increase the chance of uh, uh, still smaller eddies than those and so on and generate an eddy cascade, whereas the scaling uh, of the cascade in LEM, by contrast, has to be hardwired. And this, this uh, approach itself does generate the so-called uh, uh, five-thirds uh, power spectrum of inertial range turbulence as an outcome, as compared to putting it into LAM as an input. So a little bit more about how this uh, feedback process works. In order to construct a, a, a sampling distribution for the eddies, uh, we need to assign, in effect, a time scale to each eddy, which is going to be based on local energetics. Uh, if we had a, have a time scale, then combined with the eddy size itself, we have a velocity, and with the density, we can form energy. Obviously, we can get any of the uh, dimensional quantities of interest. And once we have this set of tau, tau values, then we have an eddy rate distribution to sample from, but with an overall empirical coefficient in front of it for the overall uh, event rate. And so the, the, uh, the concept here, you can see we're just working with dimensional quantities. So basically, we're applying mixing length concepts, except we're applying them local in space and time rather than uh, in an average sense. And the mixing length uh, surrogate here, this S, refers to a particular eddy rather than some property of the mean flow profiles, which is important because we're getting more, more local dynamics out of the mixing length uh, concept. So the way we uh, determine this unknown tau is we set up an energy balance where we have the eddy variables of the previous slide and the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have functionals of the current state of the system as represented by the property profiles. So we have something that I call available kinetic energy within an eddy. I won't go into this detail. Very importantly, we can measure the gravitational potential range the gravitational potential energy change, if this was a vertical domain and we applied an eddy, obviously we're going to change the uh, potential energy if it's a variable density system. And we also have a, what I call an op optional parameter, uh, the viscous penalty term. It turns out to uh, greatly improve the results in certain cases. And you could argue that uh, there is some threshold Reynolds number be below which uh, any turnovers cannot occur. This is a, an accepted empirical concept in turbulence, and this is a, a way of introducing it. So, so th this equation is then sufficient to determine tau for a given eddy, as I said, like mixing length, but applied in a local and steady sense. Now, there are energy couplings involved here. If there's an uh, eddy uh, applied in a, in a buoyant flow, as I said, that changes the gravitational potential energy for energy conservation. We have to have an equal and opposite change to the kinetic energy. And, in, and as I said, the triple map itself doesn't change properties of within fluid cells, so we have to have an additional operation during the eddy. So this illustrates the two steps in an eddy. One is, here we have the three 
components of velocity and some scalar. So here we apply the triplet map. It's applied the same to all of them. But then we use uh, a kernel, which is really a, a type of wavelet concept is that we can then add to individual uh, velocity profiles to change the overall kinetic energy of, uh, of a profile without changing its total momentum. In some cases, there are actually momentum sources in sinks, so we can generalize this to also uh, do the appropriate uh, momentum adjustments. So uh, this accommodates not only uh, buoyant stratified flow, potential kinetic energy exchange, but uh, various pressure velocity coupling, surface tension, and other uh, possible uh, phenomena of that sort. So here's what we get when we put these elements together and run a simulation. So in this case, we start with the step function initial velocity profile and turn on the model as I've described it to you, meaning that the diffusive advancement, in this case it's just viscous advancement because we're just running one velocity component, is simply the heat equation. And so what are we showing here in these diagrams? This is time. Each vertical line uh, has a location cor corresponding to the time of an eddy occurrence. The vertical extent of the line shows you in the lateral coordinate the range of the eddy. So this is for a mixing layer. We put in a step function initial condition, put in a tap hat initial condition, and it develops this way. Uh, now the reason the uh, turbulence is sustained in the far field of the mixing layer is because it's driven by the velocity difference, the sh imposed shear, between the two free streams. In the planar wake, the velocity is the same in the two free streams, so as the uh, viscous processes decay velocity fluctuations, we're losing the shear that drives the turbulence. That's a, that's a, a literal statement of how it operates in ODT, and it's a, uh, it's a fairly good analog of the explanation of uh, how these two uh, flows evolve. This is just a qualitative impression, and also to show you that the uh, entrainment within the model consists of some, some combination of large engulfments, uh, to use the usual terminology, uh, interspersed with uh, sort of a nibbling process that occurs in between, uh, which is somewhat suggestive of uh, how people have, suggest that, uh, in, have uh, characterized uh, free shear entrainment in general. So, if we're, so for the particular application we had in mind, there was some DNS we wanted to compare to that happened to be compressible DNS. We didn't need it to be compressible, but since it was compressible, uh, we introduced a simple way of uh, representing Mach number effects on eddies and argued that an eddy whose associated velocity, which is to say that eddy size s divided by its tau value, if, that's, if, that's large, if that com turns out to be a supersonic velocity, we wouldn't allow that uh, eddy to occur. So it just gave us a simple way of introducing a Mach number effect, which was, uh, I think was pretty effective, but again, it was more a means to the end in this particular context. And uh, so, so this just shows, uh, after we uh, did some benchmarking, you know, setting up parameters, uh, that we were able to capture some behaviors of uh, some DNS by uh, Carlos Pantano and uh, Sutano Sarkar of variable density mixing layers. And this, uh, so what's varied here is the density ratio, which is a, a, the ratio of the densities in the faster free stream to the smaller free stream. And so we have mean uh, uh, velocity and density profiles and also some uh, turbulent kinetic energy budget terms. And the model captures uh, a lot of the detail uh, that seems these flows at the, under the different conditions. The point that I want to highlight here is the overall growth rate of the mixing layer. Uh, first of all, if you have a so-called temporally evolving system where you set up, uh, as you can do it uh, best in a DNS, a flow where you have equal and opposite velocities headed, say, uh, to in the positive and ne negative direction, you can see by symmetry that there, that there shouldn't be a uh, dependence on uh, whether, uh, you know, which stream has the uh, denser fluid and which stream has the less dense fluid. So, of course, the results end up, uh, in the temporal case, uh, being uh, symmetric, mm -hmm. that S equals 1. Now, the now, why does the uh, growth rate fall off uh, as you go to higher density ratio? Well, the reason is because if you have 
a very light fluid running, running against a very dense fluid. Imagine water versus air, but let's take out the gravitational effect, okay? Per unit volume, the water, the air carries so little momentum that it's very hard for it to transfer momentum uh, you know, to the, uh, to the uh, water. I mean, imagine trying to move this wall just by blowing on it. I mean, anyone want to give it a try? <laughs> it's, uh, you, you can see that's a losing proposition. So the growth rate, the ability of the lighter layer to penetrate the heavier has to fall off and then, uh, you know, uh, dramatically no matter which, which side it's on. So that's the temporal ODT. Now, for the spatial case, you introduce an asymmetry because the faster stream uh, has a shorter resonance time getting to a different downstream location that, uh, than the uh, slower stream, which has a longer resonance time. So there's a certain asymmetry in terms of the uh, interaction between these two streams. So as you would expect, you see this asymmetry and what it does it, in effect, uh, its leading order effect is to shift the distribution so it's not quite uh, symmetric. But aside from that, it doesn't have any qualitative uh, effect on the fact that the growth rate uh, falls off in either direction. I've shown two different measures of growth rate because uh, there are a lot of different ways to measure it. Now the point here is that the prevailing uh, uh, understanding in the, en in the uh, engineering community is that the uh, growth rate measured in this way is a monotonic function. This is the model that was developed for it by Paul Dimitakis. And you can see that for the experimental data that was available, this is uh, uh, Brown and Roshko uh, uh, Caltech experiments that are famous for uh, the discovery of uh, organized structure, but they were also useful for uh, growth rate analysis. And uh, within the range that they measured, you could see that it was monotonic, and uh, Paul developed a model that has some plausible but uh, far from rigorous assumptions in it. But uh, as you see, what the model does is something that, just by the basic physical argument I've given here about you know, water interacting with air, uh, it couldn't, uh, we really don't think it could be uh, doing the physically correcting out here. I've discussed this with him. He says, well, it was really just an empirical attempt to correlate these da data. But it's been interpreted with the en within the engineering community, solve problem, use Dematakis formula, and if you want to go to higher density ratios, which is very important for designing a scramjet and so on, this is what they rely on. But you can see that by uh, uh, exploring outside the region that had been accessible previously uh, in terms of experiment, we've seen that it's really a far different beha behavior with very uh, strong implications for uh, those kind of design issues. Not at all surprising in view of the physics, but the important contribution beyond the qualitative observation is that ODT suggests that this turnaround will be seen very soon uh, after the experimentally explored range if they could just go to uh, slightly higher S values. Well, this is a log plot, but I'm saying it's not wildly uh, inaccessible uh, to, uh, to be able to explore uh, this, this turnaround. And uh, Neil Sandham did a stability analysis. He said he couldn't really push it beyond here. He kind of ran into a mathematical uh, inconsistency, with, which might be because uh, this curve is trying to turn over and the, uh, and the mathematics wasn't designed uh, to accommodate that. And this is just showing you a, a you know, similar space-time diagram as before this time for the variable density case, just to get, give you a sense that uh, it's able to expand much more rapidly, of course, into the uh, low density side as compared to penetrating the high density side. Here's just an instantaneous snapshot where a chunk of high density fluid, it's actually this chunk here. It's been brought in here, but then you see it, it persists. It, it, you know, the, it, once it's in here, it takes a while for, the, uh, for it to be assimilated due to the weak momentum coupling. So now we're going to uh, go on to the introduction of particles into ODT. The basic issue is how do we represent particle eddy interaction given that the eddies in ODT are instantaneous? Well, we introduce uh, an internal time coordinate to an eddy. We say we have some eddy lifetime that's proportional to the sampling time or time between eddies uh, of that type, the, the tau that I uh, showed you before. And then we basically integrate the drag law of the particle within the eddy over that uh, presumed eddy lifetime, and we make an assumption about the 
gas velocity that it sees based on the idea that uh, the cell that it's in within the triplet map will experience a certain displacement over this eddy lifetime, and that, so we can take the ratio of those two and get a, a gas velocity. So in any case, we can then develop a, a particle eddy interaction, and uh, uh, so we're able to use that then to uh, simulate inertial particles uh, in a turbulent flow, and in particular, uh, we've done that for uh, uh, channel flow. So, well, we'll discuss the ODT, which are the diamonds, less. First, let's look at the measurements. What happens is uh, we're looking at particle deposition, okay? And so we have inc so we start from low particle inertia. At zero inertia, there's no deposition because the particles uh, you know, it's never fluid element that gets all the way to the wall. And since there's no slip at no inertia, you have zero depositions. So the, the deposition uh, essentially rises till it, in the scale coordinate, it's order unity, which basically means that particles are being ballistically uh, projected towards the wall, and there they deposit. And what's been seen in experiments and in simulations is that uh, you know, once you get to that ballistic regime, well, it doesn't matter how much more inertia it has, if it's a cannonball or if it's an asteroid, it's just going to shoot uh, straight towards the wall. And that's, that's what we saw. Well, at ODT, with ODT, we saw an interesting decay with a minus two-thirds slope here. Then we explored further to understand this discrepancy. What we did is we, we looked at this time-resolved deposition rates. Now, uh, in the DNS and LES in particular uh, that, are, that are up here, uh, they basically gave you a time average deposition rate over uh, the time periods indicated by these lines. And as you see, uh, they were, the, the average over this time, once we in ODT looked at time resolved deposition, you can see they were aver averaging over some very severe transient here. <coughs> and only much later, you see, you see that in the actual asymptotic regime, you have these much lower values as indicated here. When we take ODT and just run it for this amount of time, and just take the time average, then we get, in those runs, values that very well agree with what came out of the DNS and LES. So the ODT and LES are in perfect agreement when we do the apples to apples comparison. It's just they didn't look at the time resolution to recognize that this process they're looking at is nothing more than an initial transient. What's happening is you have these ballistic particles coming in, and if they're not, if they're pointed anywhere but almost, uh, well, this isn't very high inertia. This is just moderate inertia as, a, as an illustration. But if they're pointed more or less toward the wall, they deposit very quickly. In that, that case, inertia is irrelevant. But suppose they're lined up so they're initially uh, headed almost axially. Then inertia is crucial for them to hit the wall because they have to be deflected by the flow. In infinite inertia, they'd never hit the wall if they were lined up uh, exactly uh, axially. So inertia goes from being irrelevant to being crucial for a certain subset of the <coughs> particles. Now, th that subset uh, that accounts for this deposition is, of course, very small in number compared to the number of particles in this group. So uh, some people ask, why do we care about those? Because we're, in, you know, because most of the particles, you know, do correspond to this deposition rate. Well, in many cases, that's all you care about. But suppose you're designing uh, an incinerator for chemical weapons, where you're told to destroy, and, and so the chemical, it's a liquid uh, chemical, and it gets sprayed in, and this is, uh, you know, these things exist, and the, the criterion is usually that 99.999% of the mass has to be destroyed, and that's, that's how they're designed, okay? So, so, you, so it's not good enough to get 92%. In other words, you have to get, uh, uh, you have to get uh, all, all these particles destroyed. Now, if you had some process where instead of, you know, in some cases you burn them, if you had some process that involved the deposition uh, to the wall of particles, for instance, then, uh, you know, and, and if you were waiting for a certain, number, a certain very large proportion of them to be deposited, then you would greatly underestimate the uh, channel length required for that design if you didn't take into account this transient nature. The other thing about transient is even though these uh, points tend to lay over each other, this is a log plot, and uh, in fact, the detailed results are going to depend very much on the initial 
particle uh, angular distribution. So all they're measuring is a configuration-specific transient. The actual, the only thing that's generic is the asymptotic behavior. So from a, from a physics viewpoint, the, the only thing you could say about this uh, th that's generic is this uh, two-thirds behavior, and, and this is kind of uh, besides the point from uh, that perspective. So uh, now I'm going to talk about something that was known uh, well before uh, the modeling uh, that I've introduced, but it's such a remarkable effect that I just thought you might enjoy hearing about it. Suppose you're in a gravitationally stable uh, fluid, and you have some shear applied, and so we're looking at vertical profiles uh, so that you're able to generate turbulence. What happens? Layers spontaneously form. And the interpretation here is that if you can form a layer, in other words, a, a local region where the density profile flattens, then you no longer have the gravitational uh, effect opposing the turbulence. So the turbulence tends to maintain the well-mixed state of it, and therefore you get uh, uh, well-mixed regions. And, and just because you've imposed initial gradient, then you have to have uh, these uh, cliffs form up in between those mixed regions. This is from an experiment. And this is simply to show that ODT uh, reproduces this. In fact, it turns out that ODT, these experiments are very hard to do and very hard to characterize, uh, you know, to set up so, so you can easily interpret them. So ODT has actually been useful in clarifying some of the uh, parameter dependencies of the uh, layer size growth rate. But uh, in this context, it's um, uh, more uh, to the point of just illustrating interesting uh, features of turbulence. Now suppose you go one more step and introduce two scalars with different diffusivities. Now here you have a very interesting effect uh, when you uh, have a, in this case, let's start with a, a stable a stratification of salt, a slow diffuser, uniform initial temperature, a faster diffuser, uh, but then start heating it below, so you're raising the temperature near the bottom. So you end up generating a very sharp staircase that was first observed actually in the ocean. It's been reproduced in the laboratory. So what happens is that if you do develop a well-mixed region, so the salinity is a very sharp jump, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, you know, slow diffuser, but a little bit of the temperature uh, can leak through, and then it can produce a new instability, because you have a high temperature below. You basically are, are set up to, to initiate Rayleigh convection. Right? When you leak through enough temperature, uh, heat to, to exceed a, a Rayleigh number criterion, then you're able to generate a new layer and so on. And what happens is, over time, you build up this uh, staircase. You can see the, the density inversions uh, that, occur, that occur over here. So. Uh, so this, so this is uh, just uh, an interesting feature for those who uh, might not have seen it before. An OET can then be used to see, to track the uh, layer for you know the layer the development of new layers and the growth of the overall uh, staircase system over time uh, versus a uh, an experiment in this case. Now in this case there were no parameters in ODT. First of all, uh, the velocity was omitted because just the buoyant part of that uh, rate expression that I showed you was sufficient. I indicated potential or kinetic energy can provide available energy to turn over eddies. So by just running the density alone, it's possible to eliminate parameters from the model and uh, you know, get this comparison. And also there are other quantitative things. You can look at the ratio of the two scalar fluxes as a function of the density jumps across interfaces. Lots of interesting physics here, uh, but uh, won't go into that right now. So I'm going to conclude with uh, one more uh, uh, surprising behavior of turbulence. So we have a turbulent jet that has two species in it, say, uh, uh, of different diffusivities, whatever you want, hydrogen and uh, nitrogen, uh, any two species. So, uh, so which, which of the species uh, spread faster? Well, what was observed, and obviously it's going to be not what you expect, or uh, I wouldn't have brought this up. It turns out that the heavy species spreads faster, and that was observed in experiments quite a while ago. And then uh, Phil Safman came along and he explained it. He said, let's say you have some turbulent eddy moving out this way. Well, by, uh, it's by continuity somewhere, there's an inflow. 
And so what happens is both species are riding on the outbound train, but the one with the faster diffusivity is more nimble. It's able to jump off the outbound train and get on the inbound train. Okay? So, but the, the lower diffusivity one is stuck on the outbound train, so it spreads farther. And so it's Phil Sassman who first pointed, the, uh, pointed that out. Now, that's very interesting because if you were developing an eddy diffusivity model and you said, well, my uh, so-called eddy diffusivity, it, my total diffusivity is the sum of my eddy diffusivity and my molecular diffusivity so that when my uh, turb as in my model, as I parametrically reduce my turbulence to zero, what I'm left is is just my molecular diffusivity. Makes perfect sense, except as you see, these two things aren't necessarily additive in terms of measuring the transport, because in this case, there's a negative effect of the uh, true molecular diffusivity. What it says is that this concept of turbulent transport as a diffusivity has some fundamental flaws that we can't necessarily um, uh, use safely in all instances. And also, I show you this to tell you uh, specifically that this is an effect that's too inherently multidimensional to be captured by LEM and ODT. So it's the opposite of everything else where I showed you where we got insights from the model. Here I'm saying that there are also important counterintuitive things that uh, we'll have to discover by other means than the models uh, uh, that I've shown you. In this case, they were first revealed experimentally uh, before Sackman had the insight uh, to explain them. So, so, considering how many interesting or unexpected developments arose from the limited number of studies we've done, I can't help but believe there's a lot more remaining to be learned. I think uh, I've uh, shown you that the modeling approach I described makes useful uh, contributions simply because it's an affordable way to explore regimes that in many instances we can't reach uh, yet by any other method. But, uh, uh, but in and of themselves, they're just one of our tools complementary to others. And I think there's a lot more to be learned by just continuing to explore other regimes that haven't been investigated by whatever means are at our disposal. Thank you. Well, that was a very interesting review from you. Thank you. Do we have some uh, questions? Uh, yeah. Alan, uh, you mentioned that you have something called mixing time in you um, earlier in your talk. And it seemed to me if you get the right mixing time in your model, you're going to get the right answer. If you put the wrong mixing time, you're going to get the wrong answer. So you didn't really say too much. How do you get this mix in time? That time scale, the tau that I was describing? Right. Yeah. I'll get that there. The... time scale associated with, with an eddy, and you have the eddy size. Okay. And I said that uh, if we go to this slide, we have, from, based on that, uh, that time and size, you can associate some estimate of eddy velocity as this, right? So, so that times the mass density is an energy density. And then we multiply by the size to get a scale for the total energy. Uh, so uh, uh, total kinetic energy associated with that eddy. Okay. So if we can figure out the kinetic energy associated with the eddy, we can back out what its turnover time will be. So now we have to identify a, a kinetic energy with this eddy. And we have to identify what are the available sources of, of that energy. Now, when I say source, let's, let's put aside a, a buoyancy for the moment, okay, potential energy. So we only have kinetic energy. So 
we want to we want to know what is the kinetic energy content of this eddy. Well, we're advancing velocity profiles during the simulation. So within the range of the eddy, we can look at those velocity profiles and develop some metric as to how much kinetic energy do we deem to be available for this eddy to turn over within those velocity profiles. There are some technicalities as to exactly how we define what we mean by available, but putting that aside, the concept is the energy is already there. The point is we have two representations of a time scale. One is inherent in a metric that we can determine from the velocity profiles we're involving. Uh, but we simply, uh, so, we, so we say that we, since we have, in other words, if you had the actual flow, like a DNS, and if you had a flow available, and I said, what is the turnover time for an eddy driven by an eddy in this subvolume? driven by this flow. You could probably give me a pretty good answer. Okay? So because we have this velocity available, we can get a pretty good answer locally. But we're not saying it's any global time. It's just the specific time under that specific condition at that location in the simulation. So it's a specialized time just for that one eddy. And just because it's a certain size doesn't automatically say it'll have a certain time scale. So why can't I just do this? The reason you can't do that is because U prime is some global measure in this. There may be well, in the eddy. You have a, you, Well, in essence, we're we're getting something that's the local analog of U prime. Yeah, it's not yeah. U prime overall. It's I mean, it's, it's whatever the, flu the velocity fluctuation is in the eddy. Well, okay. This gets to an important point about the model. If the eddy is this large. In the velocity profile in it, looks like this. Oh, there's a problem. Well, let me see. There's a root pro u prime, I guess. There is a u prime, but the pro what we say is that, uh, well, let me, let me tell, you, tell you how we go about it. We add a, a specific function, we call it the kernel function. It happens to have this shape for technical reasons. It, I, I drew it in a skewed way, but actually the mean is zero. It's a symmetric function. And we, what we do is we, we say, um, we look at u plus c k, and then we, uh, and then we integrate that over the dy. I have to look at u plus c k squared, and we say, if we added a kernel, you know, a, an object of, cer of a certain shape to this velocity profile, to write dy, and then choose c to minimize the total kinetic energy, that would tell us how much energy we could extract by applying this kernel. Now, why do we go through this contortion instead of just taking u prime? Yeah. The reason is because we want to enforce the concept of scale locality. Uh, an effect mm -hmm. at a certain scale has to be associated with a causation at the same scale. In this picture, all the causation lives at a much smaller scale. We don't want that to be driving an eddy of this size. If we want to see some causation that's at the scale of the eddy in order to attribute that uh, 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 to the uh, you know, dri driving mechanism that turns the eddy over. That doesn't mean we're neglecting this. There will be other smaller eddies that aren't sensitive to fluctuation this, at this scale. So at any this size, a kernel of this shape will be able to detect available energy to drive an eddy of this size. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is the ratio of uh, number of assumptions involved in one in a particular calculation divided by number of predictions possible in the calculation? Oh, zero, because there's an unlimited number of predictions possible. Uh, it's something over infinity is zero. Well, let me give an example. Um, one? Well, yeah. well, let's put it this way. This, this talk was not about prediction. This was about qualitative insight. If you want to have a discussion of prediction, we could do that. It'd be a long well, story because it's about 20 single, papers published. Single, single prediction. Huh? Show single prediction. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I, I had a few of those. You know, sort of as a... Okay, this is a simple prediction. We only had to tune... Uh, well, we have three. Oh, let's see. How, it tells you how many parameters we had here. 
Okay, so the, so if it, it's single predictions, then the ratio is three. Wait a second. No, it's in single predict. It depends what you call single prediction. There's a, th these are I predict. Here we have many predictions. I've shown mm -hmm. over various s values. We only tune to one particular case, and also the same parameters are pl applicable to other flows as well. Not all other flows. In other words, uh, you, I only showed you four, uh, four results. If you look at this paper, you'll see about 15 plot frames of outcomes of predictions having two and three parameters. And you can look at that and figure out, it's a, it's a small, you'll see there's a lot of prediction comes out of this. Because, you know, when you're predicting profiles like this, there are all kinds of features in here you have to look at. The asymmetries associated with the spatial development and how those are captured. See, there's, there's an asymmetric function there. Well, when I talk about predictions, can you change the geometry and Reynolds, and Reynolds number and using this, this stuff to uh, predict the results? Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, I'll show you change in geometry. Okay, so you have to look at... Then there's a, a paper where we, for the same set of parameters, we did, just like I just showed you, the, uh, the kinetic energy budgets, mean <coughs> and various profiles, both for the planar mixing layer and for the planar wake, with the same set of conditions, same set of inputs. And we got similar sets of results for both of those flows. Okay, yes? Staying uh, with the mixing layer, we know that by applying, for example, excitation to a mixing layer, we can influence the growth rate. Would you be able to capture this in your OVT model? It depends on how we would parameterize the exc excitation. I've given some thought to that. You know, it's, it'd be done in an indirect way because a lot of these things have to do with uh, instability waves and so forth. Yeah. Um, it would be a highly uh, parameterized or idealized representation. I could see ways of attempting to do that, but until we did it and saw that it worked, I wouldn't make any claims. But uh, I think things like that are worth trying. Okay. And then the very general question, I did not understand for your density uh, difference, density ratio. This, uh, you did not consider buoyancy in this case, right? No, no buoyancy no. in okay. that case. Yeah, I was simply imitating the DNS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But of course, we've done buoyancy yes, studies in other contexts. Yeah, 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 for the specific yeah, yeah. case. Right, yeah. Alan, I have a general question. Yeah. In fact, it concerns the base of your model. Yeah. In fact, in some sense, there are contradictions between Kolmogorov picture of turbulence and your model. In what, in what sense? You have just, just st steering, okay? But in the Kolmogorov picture of turbulence, we have advection effects of the vertices not only steering, but are convected also. So, it's not clear for me if, if we really skip the Kolmogorov picture. Interestingly, okay, let me make one comment. Let me make a couple, couple comments. First of all, with this, one thing this model omits is the, uh, is the, the large, ed the sweeping of the small yeah, eddies by the it's large sweeping. eddies. It's missing here. It's missing the sweeping. But interestingly, that's not part of the Kolmogorov picture specifically. In fact, this model, I call it the embodiment of the Kolmogorov picture because Kolmogorov didn't come up with the, I mean, well, what he did was by similarity theory. So let's talk about Ansager's picture, okay? Uh, basically, uh, the picture is that you have a local cascade and it's non-dissipative. And that's all you need to get the four-thirds scaling. If, now, the, the ODT model, by construction, conforms to those two, uh, you know, those two attributes. And for that reason, I haven't shown it to you, but it, uh, you know, it generates very nice, uh, you know, minus five-thirds uh, power spectrum. Yes, I understand. But for example, you know that this picture is very important for Lagrangian characteristics. So, if your model is good for prediction of Lagrangian characteristics, because if we skip this uh, sweeping of vertices, yeah. we, we kill uh, Lagrangian characteristics. I wouldn't use this model uh, to predict the Lagrangian acceleration PDF, okay? So it's outside of your model. Right, generation. yeah, right. And the second question, in fact, you know, we know very well that, the, for example, the 
the condensation of particles is very sensitive, sensitive to the, uh, the velocity divergence. For example, divergence of velocity equals zero. Your, your model does, doesn't respect this condition. So, how we can, uh, it, it what obeys. sense we calculate? Maybe it's mean concentration, but instantaneous concentration. I calculate it or not? Now, okay. The, well, you're talking about the solenoidal condition. The, the model obeys conservation of volume, which is the solenoidal condition. I agree. But it doesn't do it in the way of the solenoidal condition because it does it by a jump process, okay? So uh, I'm tr trying to see exactly what your concern is about um, you know, not obeying the solenoidal condition in the usual way, zero divergence. But we have to respect, uh, for example, we want to, to describe the, I, d I don't know, the the rep repartition of particles in, in the space. Are you talking about like particle clustering? Yes, for, for example. For ex oh, wait a second. What, what, what happens in this case? Wait a second, I got something If you don't you. respect this condition. I didn't pay him, I didn't pay him a penny. <laughs> <laughs> right? You, I, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't arrange this in advance. Right. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. And show. Now we got to go to a, di a different uh, PowerPoint. Let's see. Please stand by. Now, one point that this slide makes is, even though triplet map is convenient in 1D, it also can be done in multiple directions, multiple dimensions. So we have, we can have a group of particles in here. We can do the compressed copy flip. But now, since we have triple, the, triple number of particles, we randomly choose one of the three particle copies, and that's our result. Then if we want to do, if we're interested only in low inertia, it's good enough compared to what I just described, to take each displacement by the triplet map and just, um, multi you know, just multiply it by a, uh, a factor 1 plus s to get the, the um, uh, displacement with inertia. And this s is like a Stokes number. And the point is that when we do that, I'm showing you multi-dimension, but it also happens in 1D, if you just do it in 1D. So the blue, the red is no inertia. I don't know if there's a greatest representation here, but they're not clustering. The blue is uh, with inertia, and you see clustering. And the way to think of it is, if there was no inertia, you're kind of compressing, you're getting three, three times the density, copying, and it doesn't matter about flipping in the middle, so you end up uniform. But, but when you apply inertia, it turns out that the, you kind of, uh, you kind of uh, end up compressing ex having extra effective compression on these up here and less compression here, and you get kind of a, a density fluctuation. Even more so, when you take the model I just described in any number of dimensions, and you look at the radial distribution function, it's been noticed heuristically, and DNS shows that you get that the radial distribution function has a, an r to the minus coefficient times the product of Stokes numbers, okay? Exact mathematical analysis of what I just described, no approximations at all, reproduces to leading order when these are small, this dependence, okay? And what I actually say in that regard is that we actually learn something about clustering, that it ultimately can be understood as having a geometrical basis, because all I did was apply a sequence of geometrical operations plus 
that you know math, that multiplicative change in the particle slip relative to the uh, fluid displacement, and was able to get this effect. So we so it turns out when you actually deconstruct the mathematical analysis, that simply because the slip is taking proportional displacement enforces within the analysis a power law dependence uh, of uh, G on R. Second of all, clustering is bilinear in S, and it turns out the, the continuity of the map is crucial, otherwise you would get it as a first order effect. Continuity meaning, here's kind of a, a 2D rendition of some, you know, some color rendering of a field, you compress, copy, flip, and you see there are no discontinuities in color, and that's crucial for this uh, second property. So I, th I don't know, to what extent this addresses your question? It's interesting. I don't, I'm not sure it's the answer to the question, but. No, it's not. Oh, good. All right. Well, now let's talk about your question. I thought it was a good excuse to share this. Incompressible flow. Huh? Incompressible with, uh, with u, u equal to zero. Yeah. Passive scalars without any inertia cluster. No inertia, nothing. Because, because of the structure of the field. Uh, Are you talking about the ramp and cliff? Of course. Well, I showed you that already. Okay. You cannot get it, with, you cannot get it without uh, the uh, view equal to zero. It's okay, I can't get it, but, but let me show you what, what the model it, gave. Your model is one dimensional. In, in one dimensional case, because of the Burgers like properties, there is always uh, Okay. Jumps. No, you've convinced me. No. This is not Burgers. Burgers has know, shocks because of the way the density works. This is conservative, and it does show the uh, the, the ramp and cliff structure. You told me you tell me it's impossible. I accept that, but I'm telling you in return, it produces that. Okay, but yeah. Then I think perhaps we should uh, continue this uh, elsewhere and a little bit later. So uh, tonight, let's thank Alan. <laughs>